Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. That's, uh, and thank you, Simon. Um, as the main protagonist of our discussion today, Comrade Smigelski was a Polish immigrant. I just wanted to take this opportunity of saying how much I, my family, and Britain as a, as a whole have benefited from Polish immigration, and how deeply ashamed I am that the British Polish community have been made to feel unwelcome in the last few weeks. Anyway, uh, here is a picture of Polish immigrant and Leicester's town planner, Konrad Szmigelski, taken in 1964. He stands in front of images from his plans. Above is displayed the city of gleaming towers, tabula rasa, internationalism, Corbusianism and megastructures. Below is the city of genius loci, piazzas, townscape, crayon perspectives and conservation. Whether these contradictions in planning philosophy were the result of hypocrisy, schizophrenia, or a coherent philosophy that proved inadequate under external pressures, they are contradictions that were widespread. In this, as in much else, Schmigelski is representative of architectural and planning culture of the 1960s more generally. This talk is going to be about 1960s architect planners and the way that they approached and thought about existing city centres. I hope it can give some context for what Schmigelski was trying to achieve at Leicester, although I'll only touch on Leicester occasionally. Historians, when granting the architectural production of the 1960s a distinctive flavour, tend to see it in opposition to an earlier modernism, characterised as, to quote David Kynaston, a soft, relatively humanist modernism, and instead distinguished it as standing, to quote Peter Mandler, for something starker, harder, more ruthless. Undoubtedly, something of this happened in the way buildings looked, in the penchant for heavy and robust forms, and in the use of exposed concrete. Such a progression can be illustrated, for example, in the oeuvre of Chamberlain, Powell and Bond, from the jubilant colours of their early projects, such as Golden Lane, to the concrete gigantism of the Barbican. The question is whether this hardening of style was paralleled by a coarsening in the general approach to cities, whether brutalism as a look is synonymous with brutality of approach. Certainly, we do not have to look very hard to find brutality in much of the disregard for the historic cityscape, the belligerent application of inner city motorways, and the overbearing scale of development. But these events were not often driven by a blind adherence to a philosophy of tabula rasa planning. It is one of the paradoxes of the period that architect planners advocating these changes tended to be those who characterised themselves as, I quote, the soft people of the 50s, the readers and contributors of the Architectural Review, admirers of Gordon Cullen, the people who were, made the words genius loci a cliché. None of this is to suggest that modernists were always proto-preservationists, and I hope that by focusing on a few re recurring motifs from the dialogue of the period, this talk can help to illuminate the differences between the post-war ideal of rehabilitation and our contemporary ideal of conservation. Nonetheless, the 60s holds a curious dual role in that the decade saw both a crescendo in the history of urban renewal and also the beginning of a very long consensus going back at least as far as the 19th century that renewal of cities should be on a large, comprehensive scale, rather than through piecemeal interventions. These two processes, although seemingly at odds, were often intertwined. The talk is not intended to provide an apologia for the figure of the architect planner or of the modernist project. There is much wonderful 60s architecture in Britain. But it is not the purpose of this talk to convince you to share my love of Preston Bus Station, the Balfron Tower, the National Theatre, 
or indeed the Leicester Engineering Building. The best modernist architecture is very rarely located in city centres or historic towns. City centre schemes tended to be made up of a gimcrack modernism, of tacky pedestrian precincts, grim underpasses, budget megastructures and galumphing car parks. A modernism which was the product of public-private partnership and often designed by anonymous firms. This talk is about the invisible, everyday modernism that made up a ratio of every British city. It is about the cityscape chronicled and denigrated in books like Britain's Crap Towns and Martin Parr's Boring Postcards. Whether or not the cityscape of the post-war period is crap, it was not boring, as it articulated British hopes and fears about the future. In the course of this talk, I am going to draw out three important themes from the modernist dialogue of the period, about traffic, <coughs> about the approach to historic buildings, and about economic optimism. So, as a preliminary point of departure, it is essential to stress the centrality of the post-war growth of traffic, which was a major concern of the period with wide-ranging implications for planning and architectural thought. The motor car revolution was seen to invalidate traditional layouts of cities. I, as one pamphlet put it, with a characteristically apocalyptic tone, I quote, what has finally shattered the old scene, both in small towns and large ones, during the past generation or two, has been the arrival of the universal motor car, with its threat of delay, distraction, and death. The same street pattern still exists, but it is now filled with a tangle of buses, taxis, delivery vans, private cars, cycles, and pedestrians, both stationary and moving, or at least wishing to, delaying, harassing, injuring, and even killing each other." End quote. The number of licensed motor vehicles in Britain had doubled from 4.5 million to 9 million between 1950 and 1960, and was correctly predicted to carry on rising. It was common to set forth an historical argument whereby the decentralising and suburbanising effects engendered by the automobile had overtaken the cholera and overcrowding engendered by railways as the primary ill of cities. The importance of traffic for approaches towards the built environment was explosively explored in Colin Buchanan's Traffic in Towns, published in 1963. The report is key to understanding the subject because of the way it energised discourse, giving planners both a rhetorical bolstering and added clarity of purpose. It received unprecedented publicity, being glowingly written up by publications ranging from the tablet to the daily worker, to cite only the two of the more unexpected, and was published in a popular shortened edition as a Penguin special. Buchanan saw the issue essentially in terms of the design of the built environment. The design solutions Buchanan proposed, as he is generous in admitting, were not original, but came from an engagement with current British ideas and practice. Traffic in towns was therefore summative rather than innovative. The argument of the Buchanan report was that if a large proportion of traffic was to be accommodated in large cities without totally destroying their amenity value, there would need to be massive reconstruction of cities. And if the community was unable or unwilling to pay for this, then a restriction of traffic would be necessary. Buchanan saw the solution in terms of design. As he put it in an article, urban planning was the only way to avoid future chaos. I quote, we have taken the bull into the china shop. And to that old problem, there are only two answers. Shoot the bull, or more creatively, build a new china shop specifically designed for bulls. <laughs> 
The report, following the format of a civil service paper, presented various shades of these two options, with their attendant advantages and disadvantages, without definitively advocating either. As an aside, Leicester's traffic plan, which you'll hear more about, follows this same format. Certainly the most extreme and most publicised of Buchanan's case studies, for a fully automated Fitzrovia on multiple levels, with a dizzying armature of multi-lane motorways, was something of a reductio ad absurdum. Many commentators on the Buchanan report, both on its publication and since, have therefore argued that it has been widely misinterpreted as offering, as Buchanan himself put it in 1983, a blueprint for the total reconstruction of towns and cities with traffic circulation at different levels, costing a fortune and not very nice to look at into the bargain. Buchanan's plan for Cardiff, though, from 1966, makes it clear that Buchanan, whatever the nuances, certainly was advocating very radical re reconstruction indeed, and lobbied hard throughout the 60s for more funds to be made available for such projects. The Minister of Transport, Ernest Marples, certainly read, or misread, the report as a call for radical reconstruction. As he said, I believe that the old Roman concept of a road, a pavement, and a building, the way we have been building for over a thousand years, is now outdated. It is fundamental to the whole report that it accepts the motor vehicle as a brilliant and beneficial invention. It is, no sense, it is in no sense restricting the motor car. All it says is that we must use our motor cars to the maximum and yet be sensible and keep some good environmental areas. We have to face the fact, whether we like it or not, that we have built our towns in entirely the wrong way for traffic. We want an entirely different type of town." End quote. There were two ways to build a town for cars, through, to use the jargon of the period, vertical or horizontal segregation of vehicles and pedestrians, through pedestrian precincts and traffic architecture. Before going on to describe these two modes of achieving pedestrian segregation, I want to stress something striking and notable about the way schemes for segregation were presented in this period. The rhetoric surrounding the pedestrianisation schemes encouraged by post-war plans provides a striking practical example of a gambit of relating modernising schemes to tradition. Such rhetoric helps us to begin to tie traffic management together with another phenomenon that this talk will show to have influenced planners, a cross-cultural reinvestment in distinctly urban values often expressed through the visual tropes of the townscape movement. Cars were a profound assault on the traditional layout of cities, with their dual pincer movement of imposing suburbanisation at the periphery, whilst destroying the amenity at the centre through congestion, hazard and ugliness. In parallel with the ascendancy of modernism in this period, there was a simultaneously, simultaneous an interlinked reinvestment in the traditional virtues and values of urban life, all those qualities the car was endangering. The trend was often centred on the slippery term urbanity, which melded together that word's 18th century import of genteel politesse, with a romantic view of the aesthetic and social benefits of compactly laid out development. It was a word that, significantly, concertinaed the Victorian period, suggesting a direct link between modernism and a pre-Victorian past. The word had entered architectural discourse through the interwar writings of Arthur Tristan Edwards and was pushed for by planners in the 1940s, such as Thomas Sharp. In the 1960s, urbanity remained a core value and, in the face of the profound onslaught of increasing car usage, radical modernist solutions were often presented in the conservative light of being the only way to preserve or recreate these qualities. 
The first way to achieve segregation of vehicles and pedestrians was through a pedestrian precinct, which relegated traffic to the perimeter of a site. Pedestrian precincts were a notable part of the planning vocabulary of the 1950s, most notably in the central shopping areas of the first generation of new towns. I've lost that slide, anyway. The senior police official, Alka Tripp, had set down the idea of segregating traffic and into a system of pedestrian precincts in the early 40s. It was common to relate these pedestrian precincts to an earlier form of development. As Tripp himself rather lushly put it, the streets and the various precincts will then become town streets of the old-fashioned type. They will cease to be maelstroms of noise and confusion and become companionable places with an air of leisure and repose. Such streets will provide a real promenade for the town dweller and a rest for jaded nerves. We shall get back to merry England. <laughs> this strange amalgam of modernism and merry England that can be heard in this quote is illustrated rather wonderfully in this unpublished design for a pub sign which shows assorted Londoners dancing the maypole around Powell and Moyer's Skylon from the Festival of Britain. It was designed by Fe Frederick Gibbard for Crisp Street Market in Poplar. Gibbard himself went further afield than Merry England in stressing the pedigree of the precinctural ideal, presenting his precinctural shopping centres for Poplar, Harlow, Doncaster, Nuneaton, or Romford, or, and many, many more, as being a modern reinterpretation of Renaissance piazzas. Gibbard's 1953 book, Town Design, had elucidated his design method, which was to create abstracted versions of Renaissance precedents, an approach that was an amalgam of Siegfried Gideon's space, time, and architecture, and Camillo Cite's the art of city build, building cities. The book analyzes urban spaces using, using an abstracted language of plastic compositions in space, enclosure, vistas through, optical barriers, and so forth, used whether Gibbard is discussing Florence, Tuscany, or Harlow, Essex. Precincts conjured up a cosmopolitan continentalism. The very word precinct, of course, also conjured up the medieval cathedral precinct. Pedestrian precincts were, as a 1955 listener article argued, therefore not new at all really, but as old as the medieval market square from which traffic used to be excluded. The architectural reviews project Westminster Regained, which was exhibited at the Tate, is perhaps the clearest indication that modernist planning was being presented as a revival. The pedestrian precinct and the cathedral precinct were being merged. Planners were keen to stress the analogy, emphasizing the traditional aspects of pedestrianization rather than its modernizing radicalism. Precincts would offer a sanctuary from the pollution and noise of motor car usage, and indeed modernity itself, in which the traditional sensations of the city could be appreciated. Pedestrian precincts became a major feature of the planning vocabulary of the 50s and 60s. Here are a few from boring postcards. Leicester's plan for the market square is a classic of the genre. Smigelski had been banging on about Italian piazzas since the 1950s, and as he put it, I quote, the open market, although the oldest form of shopping, cannot be considered an anachronism. And he hoped that turning the area into a precinct would, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I'm going to ignore that. <laughs> so anyway, okay. Um, so Schmigelski hoped that turning the area into a precinct would, I quote, rehabilitate the marketplace as a civic space for the public at large, and here's, as it was in the past. To many in the planning profession, though, the precinctual solution did not go far enough. 
They had the disadvantage of being only applicable on a small scale because of the need for servicing. Another problem was that, again due to the need for servicing, they left a sterile and desolate backside to the precinct, the place where the bins were kept. Precincts were a pyrrhic victory against traffic, as they exacerbated the mess traffic created in surrounding areas. Vertical segregation therefore seemed to offer a more total panacea to these problems, whereby all of the pedestrian functions of the city would be placed on a deck or a podium, which segregated it from traffic, parking and servicing. Buchanan called this kind of architecture traffic architecture. Deck planning was promoted by those belonging to a self-proclaimed architectural avant-garde, as well as those closer to the mainstream of planning thought. Important early instances are entries to the Berlin Hutschdalt competition by Colin Buchanan and Percy Johnson and Marshall, or Alison and Peter Smithson. Chamberlain Powell and Bond's Barbican scheme, new universities such as the University of East Anglia or the Architects Co Partnerships um, University of Essex, in the schemes for town centres, um, for Hook and Cumbernauld Newtown, as well as William Holford's Piccadilly Circus overhaul and the London County Council's plan for South Bank. By the early 1960s, such solutions were beginning to feature in plans for provincial cities and in developers' schemes. Leicester traffic plans, traffic interchanges, are one of the more elaborate expressions of such an idea. And Schmigelski described the Haymarket Shopping Centre as a multi-deck scheme. One of the important things about such schemes was that for them to be practicable, they needed to be carried out over a considerable area. Multi-level segregation, therefore, gave a spur to the need for comprehensive redevelopment over large areas rather than piecemeal chunks. And therefore, for a more, uh, 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 suggested a more brutal approach to the existing fabric of the city. This was something that made the rhetoric so appealing to developers due to the profitability of comprehensive development of whole sites on an enormous scale. These schemes are often described as Corbusian, so I think it is worth suggesting that a system of decks is, opposed, strong, is, is directly opposed to Le Corbusier's urbanism, which instead advocated for the whole ground level to be free for countryside, with motor traffic above. Indeed, Le Corbusier was characteristically vociferous in his attack on placing pedestrians above traffic arguing that, I quote, if man had the agile feet and the miraculous tail of a monkey, it might make sense. But in fact, it is madness. Madness, madness, madness. It is the bottom of the pit, a gaping pit of error, the end of everything, end quote. He goes on for some time in the same vein. The ultimate source of the idea of vertical segregation of pedestrians onto an upper walkway, although not a deck, could be Ludwig Hilbersheimer's uh, Bauhaus project, the Schema einer Hochhausstadt of 1924, or St. Elia's futurist city, New City of 1914. Whatever the case, architect planners did not stress futurism when presenting these plans. As with the pedestrian precinct, Planners were keen to locate the idea of the multi-level city in a historical continuum and presented their plans as reviving aspects of traditional urbanism. Sounds unlikely, but uh, uh, <laughs> here we go. You know, it, it's true. It was common to reach for historical exemplars when describing these schemes. Chamberlain Powell and Bond, for example, dis presented the Barbican's upper-level decks as emblematic is emblematic in being totally devoid of any futurism. Instead, they stressed the way that it was located in a tradition of London building. I quote, The principle of the podium with terraces above is, of course, not new, and can be seen today in Carlton House Terrace. The old Adelphi was a complex example of the application of this principle of separating traffic on different levels. 
Even the most radical schemes for horizontal pedestrian segregation were therefore not presented as part of some futurist or utopian reimagining of the city. But the ambition was, as Colin Buchanan related it, to reinvest in something of traditional urbanism. I'm going to quote from him. The deck would, in effect, comprise a new ground level, and upon it the buildings would rise in a pattern related to, but not dictated by the traffic below. On the deck it would be possible to recreate, in an even better form, the things that have delighted man for generations in towns. The snug, varied atmosphere, the clothes, the narrow alleys, the contrasting open squares, the effects of light and shade, the fountains and the sculpture. End quote. Wilfred Burns, a uh, uh, planner at Newcastle, also described upper level walkways in these terms. The upper level pedestrian ways, freed from vehicular traffic, will take on new forms varying from the narrow intimate shopping way to the wide pedestrian square or the enclosed arcade. End quote. Lionel Brett suggested that the pedestrian deck could be given the glamour of something new, which has always been the best possible disguise for the recapture of something old. End quote. So both pedestrian precincts and traffic architecture may appear radical modernist solutions, but to their proposers, they were also understood as recapturing something of traditional urbanism. I want to change track a little and talk a bit about the way modernist architects and planners thought about old buildings and historic, in the historic environment. The argument of this section is that when it came to historic buildings in the post-war period, what was at stake was giving important buildings an improved setting or environment, often through the creative use of demolition, and therefore at the expense of the more mundane historical fabric of the city. The post-war planner saved the plums at the expense of the pudding. These two drawings are from Frederick Gibbard's plan for St Pancras. They depict the setting of William Inwood's Greek Revival Church of All Saints in Camden, as seen from Pratt Street, as it then was, and as was proposed for the future. They give a good introduction into the way that modernist architect planners approached examples of architecture from the past. The plan calls for all the detritus of slums, mixed uses, noxious industry, and traffic mess to be swept away so as to bring a touch of the country into the heart of the town. The church, however, was to be retained, I quote, both as an example of Greek revival architecture but also because it was deemed valuable from a civic design point of view. In the second image, in the second image, the period of 1837 to 1945 has been concertinaed, so that the, the modernism is brought directly into dialogue with the Greek revival. The church can now be enjoyed amongst a pedestrianised landscape of trees and cafes, appreciated by coffee-drinking sophisticates. The church was pathetically hidden in the first image, its spire peeking ruefully over the rooftops. In the second image, demolition of the surrounding buildings has opened up new vistas and made it the central feature of a composition, albeit a semi-informal composition. The church stands now within a green space, as if it had been transformed, almost, into a modernist object building. The modern additions are deferential towards the older church in both their scale and sighting, and are in a colourlessly modern style. All Saints had been handed over to the Greek Orthodox Church in 1947. It is now Britain's Greek Orthodox Cathedral. <laughs> Although there is no mention in the plan of this functional use, or of its place in the community. Though giving the church a central indeed a dominating position, it has been deconsecrated, aestheticised and abstracted by the plan. In this Camden scheme, All Saints takes the position of what Gibbard stodgily called in his th theoretical writings a dominant vertical feature in space. <laughs> 
I'm unsure whether Gibbard had a way to distinguish whether such a dominant vertical feature in space was to be an existing church or one of his own efforts at municipal modernism, be it a poplar bell tower or a hollow tower block. Nothing came of Gibbard's scheme. But what we find on the site today nevertheless comes as a surprise. What Gibbard rendered as an indiscriminate and messy slum can never really have been anything of the sort. Instead, walking down Pratt Street, we find the quiet elegance of an early Victorian terrace. This is, I think, indicative of the blindness towards the value of the everyday fabric of the traditional city, sweepingly judging it as indeterminate slums. This minor example of Gibbard's approach to an existing church can be taken as representative of certain features of the approach of all modernist architect planners to existing historic buildings. One can see many of the features of Gibbard's approach to All Saints Camden in the much more famous examples of William Holford's plan for St Paul's Precinct or Thomas Sharp's for the area around Exeter Cathedral. It wasn't just religious buildings which served such a, an approach. It can be seen in plans such as Graham Shanklin's plan for Bolton, or Lionel Brett's for Portsmouth, which both centred on a Victorian town hall, or indeed in Walter Ball's plan for the Tower Hill precinct. Schmigelski's own attempt, uh, 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 the genre you might call it, was to open up vistas on Leicester's Corn Exchange. And he argued that, I quote, the view towards the corn exchange must be opened up by creating a paved piazza with a focal point in the form of a fountain, a sculpture, or a bandstand. End quote. The central feature of all these schemes was the creation of carefully modulated vistas on an historic monument and a pedestrianised frame from which to contemplate them. In all cases, the aim was for semi-informal views rather than grand axial vistas. It was common to argue that modernist planning, which could be freer than Beaux-Arts planning, was therefore more, more able to accommodate the existing historic environment. Creating spaces for old architecture was a central feature of the townscape approach which applied picturesque principles to new urban planning. The townscape approach can be explored through a plan for Northampton from the mid-1960s, which was prepared by Wilson and Womersley, and had Gordon Cullen as townscape advisor, in the same way that Schmigelski hired Ian Nen and Kenneth Brown to produce a townscape analysis of Leicester. The plan needed to prepare the city for an increase, the Northampton plan, needed to prepare the city for the increase in population of 100,000 people, which would accompany its designation as an expanded town. The Northampton plan was based around uniting five of the, church, the, the city's churches. As the plan put it, the primary structure of the new townscape proposal is related to the five churches, each of the four peripheral churches is connected to All Saints Church by a central route, each route having its own individual character. I quote from a description of one of these visual sequences, which were illustrated by Cullen's beguiling illustrations. The sequence north to St Sepulchre's Church from All Saints is first contained by the facade of the Ram Hotel and then by the horizon as the crest of Sheep Street is seen. It is finally enclosed by a proposed terrace of housing which continues the curve of the listed buildings in Sheep Street and focuses attention on the Round Church. The spire of St Sepulchre's is seen suddenly as it comes into view as Sheep Street is left behind. End quote. The churches are therefore made part of a visual sequence, not one to be appreciated from a fixed position, as in a Beaux-Arts scheme, but to be appreciated by a roving eye. As with earlier plans I discussed, the churches have been co-opted into a civic design conception, which has little relation to their functional use. Though these buildings from the past are elevated to a central role for the image of the city, this did not entail a wholesale acceptance of the importance of conservation, especially when it came to the fabric of the Victorian city. <coughs> 
As the plan put it, I quote, There are very few old buildings other than some of the churches that escaped the fire in 1675. Most of the town is comprised of 19th century buildings that are now rapidly coming to the end of their useful life, end quote. There is a similar sentence in nearly every 60s plan. For a town plan which advertised its central conception as uniting the various spires, the planners nevertheless sanctioned the demolition of E.F. Law's Lancet-style St Andrews of 1841-2. As all of this suggests, what was considered historic and therefore worthy of retention was limited. Many had an historically conditioned perspective on British cities, especially those in the North and Midlands, as being the result of the Industrial Revolution and Victorian laissez-faire capitalism, the continuing repercussions of which they saw it as their mission to address. When it came to fitting buildings into the historic locations, there was a large and consistent literature advising how to do this. Indicative of such debates is Thomas Sharp, for whom the key was the maintenance of character. What was central for him was not disrupting the established rhythms and scale of a place. An important context, using, I quote, materials identical or very similar to those used in present buildings, end quote. It was, however, not necessary to maintain the same style. Indeed, as he said, it would be as absurd and stultifying to suggest anything of the kind, end quote. How such ambitions were actually translated into buildings was a complex business. For one, it was very hard to square such ambitions with industrialised building methods, which le uh, um, Secondly, many of the new typologies of buildings demanded by plans, from car parks to shopping centres, were simply too large for such politesse. Indeed, they work better when approached with a bit of bloody, monumental bloody-mindedness. Thirdly, it is a moot point whether anyone but a connoisseur will pick up on those buildings which do attempt to blend with an established street scene through such subtle illusions. I show several examples on the screen now, all of which were celebrated for the, their sensitivity at the time. There is a lot of this stuff about, and you can see a lot in Leicester. Anyway, my third theme is economic optimism. In the same spirit as Anthony Crossland's Future of Socialism, or of Macmillan's Affluent Society, there was a foundational belief behind the planning documents of the period that continuous economic growth would provide the basis for uninterrupted social progress. Such re rhetoric reached a crescendo in 1963. The promised prospect of an ever-expanding economy, creating all the cascading benefits of prosperity, encouraged those at the heart of deciding the shape of cities to ask, with Lewis Womersley, I quote, What is the good of being a rich country, as we are told we are, if we cannot have these desirable things? If we cannot rebuild our cities in a manner worthy of our day and age, for the convenient and delight of our citizens. Similarly, Colin Buchanan asked the question, how bold can we afford to be, answering that, this is really a matter of our faith in our own future as a nation. If we believe we have a great future, then we must also believe that the standard of living will sweep steadily up, overriding the ephemeral fluctuations of economic life. The long-term view must surely be optimistic. <laughs> a belief that we shall have the resources to remould our environment to our, like, uh, to our liking. Wilfred Burns, Newcastle's planner, went as far as to argue as if such progress was an assured fact just because it was part of government policy. As he said, the national proposals for increasing prosperity could have greatly added weight to proposals which aim at providing, improving the standard of environment within the foreseeable future, for a large number of people living in outworn or unsatisfactory parts of the city. End quote. Rapid social changes were felt, to make a, were felt to make a new type of approach towards town planning necessary than that which has been used in the direct post-war period. An expanding economy invalidated the planning of the 1940s, which had been written, as Ruth Glass put it, in a restrictionist mood, 
on premises inherited from a period of economic depression. It was based on the assumption of a sta stationary population, economy and culture, and did not provide suitable guidance of, for development in a period of expansion. End quote. Affluence. All the abundance of goods and gadgets, of cars and new buildings, in an apparently mounting flow of consumption, was creating novel changes for planners, calling for new solutions. The assumptions behind the future, uh, about the future behind, for example, a projected shopping centre, involved a belief in the inexorable progress of a meliorist programme, creating all the cascading benefits of affluence and I quote from a, an article about shopping centres in Lancashire, that there will be an improvement in economic conditions accompanied by a rise in disposable income, an increase in the number of cars, better houses requiring more spent on durable goods and more spent on food, particularly luxury foods. To put it rather broadly, in the 1960s, city centre plans have been created for the beneficiaries or the future beneficiaries of affluence. People who, like the architects themselves, and this is a quote from the Barbican plan, were envisaged as young professionals, likely to have a taste in Mediterranean holidays, French food and Scandinavian design, end quote. This, I think, is li was linked to Anthony Crossland's idea of, that a more equitable and civilised society could be built on the basis of increased economic growth. Planners focused on the needs of those emerging into affluence, with very little concept that some would be left behind. There was an element of wish fulfilment in all this, as it was exactly in those cities which were being left behind relatively that the planners most resoundingly celebrated the new world, so that Walter Bohr could say of Liverpool, with its long history of relative economic decline, I quote, all this process of renewal and rehabilitation must take into new considerations of factors such as mobility, increased leisure and greater prosperity, end quote. Before what was called, has been called the rediscovery of poverty in the 1960s, in the later 1960s, planning discourse mirrored political discourse in that it tended to ignore problems of poverty. There is a presumption that all would eventually share in the fruits of growth. A single, yet striking and indicative example of the way that some needs, needs not intertwined with a narrative of expanding affluence and modernisation, were forgotten by 1960s planning, can be seen in the strange blind spot towards the possibility that cycling could be a valid alternative to car usage. Though Buchanan himself saw the motor car as a mixed blessing before the oil price, as a mixed blessing, before the oil crisis in 1973, it was rare to see the expansion of private car ownership as anything but a beneficial thing, an enabler of social enfranchisement and a symbol of spreading prosperity. As the planner for Glasgow's in a motorway put it, with characteristic zeal, I quote, we believe that this mobility does enlarge the life of the ordinary citizen to a greater degree than any other single invention of the 20th century. End quote. The fact that Glasgow had one of the lowest car ownership levels in the country was irrelevant. Any attempt to curb or restrict car usage was commonly referred to as defeatist in plans. I quote, some people say we ought to ban cars from our cities, relying upon passes for essential cars and upon public transport. I believe that this kind of talk is quite unreal and wishful thinking. End quote. Cycling, on the other hand, is treated, if at all, blithely. Buchanan mentions techno gizmos such as jetpacks, hovercrafts, helicopters, and conveyor belts as possible substitutes for the motor car. But the bicycle was forgotten, and the possibility of cycle tracks is dismissed as, I quote, very expensive and probably impracticable. This is someone who's, you know, <laughs> suggesting all this mad stuff. Cycles receive a similarly scant or non-existent treatment in the other planning manuals or overviews of the period. At Hook Newtown, it was felt that, I quote, in view of the considerable possibility that non-powered bicycles will virtually disappear, except for their use by children, 
only a limited system of independent cycle tracks is proposed. Geoffrey Jellicoe wrote that cycling was an anachronism in the modern world. This was all despite the fact that, in a survey of six towns near London in 1957, it was discovered that 35% of journeys to work were by bicycles. Whilst even in the new town of Crawley, where no provision whatsoever had been made for cyclists, it was still found that 25% of journeys were made by this means. It's the argument of this section that economic optimism provided the intellectual fuel propelling the confidence behind attempts to restructure city centres. But in a mixed economy, where the money for this, these transformations was going to come from, unless it was from developers, remained ambiguous. Developers became adept at ventriloquising the concerns, aesthetic and general approach of modernist planners, but shorn of their redemptive aspects. The fact that the hoped for growth failed to materialise had the effect of limiting more radical approaches to the city centres. What is more, in the years after 1963, such confidence very quickly began to appear increasingly naive as the country lurched from one economic crisis to the next. Plans that had first been forged in a heat, a white heat of economic optimism, continued to grind into realisation, often enacted in a vulgarised and diluted form under the increased imperatives of financial stringency. Debt schemes were especially vulnerable, and the stunted walkways to nowhere in the City of London, Leeds or Liverpool offer perhaps the starkest manifestation of failure. The whole project of radical reconstruction was based on an economic optimism that, as the 60s progressed, could not be sustained. OK, now I'm going to briefly talk about um, Leicester. Sorry? Very briefly. Yep, um, OK. Well. I hope these three themes can help contextualise what happened at Leicester during the 1960s. I know many people in the room will know more about the specifics of Leicester than I do, and I'm looking forward to hearing how far Leicester confirms or complicates the national story as I understand it. Nonetheless, here are a few thoughts. On traffic, the Leicester traffic plan was the first plan to be released, which included an integrated land use and traffic plan along the, along the lines of the Buchanan report. It suggested radically reconstructing the city to make it accessible for the motor car, whilst preserving environmental areas through horizontal and vertical segregation. However, running in tandem with these visions of a futuristic multi-level city, Smigelski also advocated many things that preserved both the fabric and the uses of the historic city, most lastingly in the New Walk and in his pre preservation of both the function and the buildings of the Market Square. Smigelski was not alone in upholding these ideals simultaneously and in not seeing them as contradictory positions. And then, Smigelski's traffic plan was based on a fantasy of what could be achieved within the economic realities of 1960s Britain. The Ministry of Housing and Local Government were damning about the viability of the report, writing that, in the present financial climate, it seems hardly realistic. The changes to Leicester's built environment over the next decade would be considerable, but they were realised in cahoots with cheese-pairing developers and shorn of many of both their redemptive and futuristic aspects. Thank you.